Am I on? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I will dive right in. I'd like to introduce us older for those who haven't seen it before. And I'll start by just talking about why. And a few people here have already hinted at this, but I'll just come right out and say it. Low resolution model building is hard. Uh, and historically, it's been very hard. And a while back, I put some numbers to that. So at present, PDB has around 131,000 structures that have experimental data. About um, well, 4,500 of those are lower resolution than 3.5 angstroms. And this is, what the, this is a picture of those as of um, early 2018. Um, X-ray structures at the top, cryo structures at the bottom. The y-axis is a mole probability score. For those people who aren't intimately familiar with it, mole probability score is a log score of essentially rate of errors, uh, common uh, geometric errors, and has theoretical maximum for the worst possible model of a little over six. So you see for the X-ray structures there, some of those have been kind of knocking on the door of that a little bit. Um, that's, the good news is they have been getting better and better over time. A lot of these are, are very early days models. But the, the big picture to take home from this is that at these resolutions, there is no correlation between model quality and the fit to data. You can, fit, you can get very low R factors with a terrible model. You can get very high R factors with a model with very good geometric parameters. And in one sense, that shouldn't really be a surprise. The whole problem with low resolution is that there are many, many, many ways to overfit your data, and there's only really a small fraction of those are real um, solutions. Anyway, that does have an impact for the downstream users. And I'd like to just have a quick ex uh, example of that from um, the CASP uh, 13, which I was privileged enough to take part in as a um, assessor of the, of the template-based modeling results. So in that particular round, it turns out there were 1,658 existing experimental structures used as templates. And if we take a look at those in terms of resolution on the x-axis, clash score on the y-axis, well, the green bar at the bottom is where we really want to be. Um, about 11% of the models used here had a clash score less than 11%. Uh, so 11% had a clash score less than two. Um, and if we look at um, Rodimer outliers, we have see similar sort of issues and Ramachandran outlier, or non-favored Ramachandran. Well, the extreme out there is about 60% of all residues in a large model were in actually non-favored confirmation. So it's a problem, but the, the big problem that I took home from this isn't so much that there are problematic models in the PDB. I think all of us in this room probably know that. It's that many of the people taking part in this challenge who are experts in homology modeling weren't actually taking model quality into account when actually choosing their templates. And that, I think, is a very easy trap to fall into for people that don't have a background in actually looking at experimental data and building into it and, and not having gone through the challenges. It's easy to assume that the experimental structure is the structure. And I think it's a responsibility on our part to actually communicate that that isn't necessarily the case and make it as clear as possible. And I know we're doing more and more of that already. To the, to the wider community to understand that they do need to take models with a grain of salt. Um, and of course, deposition to the protein data bank is a big responsibility. That model you put there is going to be there forever and you don't know what people are going to do with it. So it's best to make sure it is going to be as good as possible. Anyway, after that preamble, talk about what Azolda is. And most of the text on this is for people following along at home later. Um, but I'll just before I start the little video here, the, I'll, I will point out that long-term aim, or possibly more of an aspiration at this point, is to blur slash eliminate that line between model building, model refinement, and validation. It's my perspective that ultimately these should become parallel processes. So they're all happening at once. You're building the model, it's refining and validating as you go. But to take a look at what Isolde is, I'll just talk you through this little demonstration video. 
of some of the features that you see. So you see live, crystall live crystallographic symmetry if you're working in a crystal structure. Um, so live Ramachandran and Rotomer validation available as markups. But the most important thing about this older is the environment is based on interactive molecular dynamics. Rather than using your traditional crystallographic restraints, which are only talking um, bonds and angles, it's taking into account all the electrostatics and van der Waals non-bonded forces as well. To do that, it does require a fairly high-powered GPU. You'll also notice as this runs, this is a real-time capture in the Windows build, actually, on my um, gaming laptop. Um, you'll see in the, 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 the crystallographic maps are updating in the background, so the structure factor calculations for this model. is three, three angstrom resolution, 320 residues. It gets around three, update, three map updates a second. Uh, various tools for, um, for common validation problems, finding them, fixing them, flipping peptide bonds, histotrans, um, et cetera, uh, dial, dialing up rotomers, all those general model building tasks. So that's um, what it looks like as of um, now, version, the version that's available out now, as released last week, uh, is 1.0 beta 4. Uh, available for all three major operating systems, although I will say it does work best in Linux and Windows, simply because Apple is getting less and less good at actually supporting GPU computing. Um, and you, to install it, simply go to in, install ChimeraX, go to their tool shed, tools, more tools, follow the links, click a few buttons, and you have it on your machine ready to go. Um, but the thing I want to... Uh, talk about is some of the actual new stuff in Azolda as of, well, the adaptive distance restraints here happened in 1.0 beta 3 early last year. The torsion restraints happened last month. Um, so Anna actually introduced a lot of the, the distance restraint stuff for me, which is very nice. Um, so I, but I will run over it very briefly. So the common scenarios for these sort of restraints is, for example, where you have a very low resolution map, but some high resolution homologue that you, that you want to use as a reference. And when I say uh, very low resolution, probably in Azolder's case, in most cases you can build quite happily in Azolder at 3 to 3.3 .3 angstrom resolution. Beyond that, you, you do start to need more help. Um, or the other situation is you have a starting model in one confirmation and you want to refit into some very different confirmation. And that one's going to become more and more important with all the, the new developments in Reliant and other um, cryo-EM uh, pipelines where you, you're getting many, many different confirmations from the one experiment. You don't want to be rebuilding each of those from scratch. You want to build one and then refit as much as possible into your other confirmations. So this is where these adaptive loss functions really come into play. They, they maintain local geometry while allowing real conformational changes over the larger scale. Now, the distance restraints are rather like Gemin McClure restraints, except they're, they're using a, a newer functional form. It comes from our benevolent overlords, well, hopefully benevolent, uh, at Google. Uh, they're uh, machine learning people um, that are a bit more of a generalization of Gemin McClure and a number of different restraint schemes, which are all similar, except they, they have a different rate at which the, which the restraints can fall off with distance. This approach um, generalizes that so that you can set that fall off rate to any, any level. I'll, I'll show you what that means in a second. That's the, the functional form. Uh, the, the only difference between my implementation here and the, the one published in the, the paper and archive is that I added a flat bottom, op, an optional flat bottom to the, these as well to allow a tolerance around your target uh, distance. So this is a, a fairly artificial example of a restraint with a 10 angstrom distance target at plus or minus one angstrom flat bottom tolerance. And you can see you can set the, um, it, with, close to your target, it acts like a normal harmonic restraint. Uh, and then as, it, uh, as, it, um, as you deviate further, it, it essentially relaxes. And to visualize what actually happens to the forces in this, this is an energy profile. Just imagine a ball sitting on one of these lines and rolling downhill, and you get an idea of how these things actually pull on your, on your model. 
Um, so those are available and have been available in Zolder for some time now using the command Zolder restrained distances. And just like any other command in Chimera X, uh, type, put the word usage in front of that command and you'll get a, a link to documentation that you get a full uh, description of exactly how they work. Um, and you can restrain the, the model either to its current configuration or to a template. If you're using a template, uh, it will essentially do a decomposition approach. It will take, find the largest rigid body alignment, restrain that, take the residuals, find the largest uh, rigid body alignment again, and break it down further and further and further until there's nothing left to restrain. Generally takes a few seconds. Um, this is what it looks like. All the green lines here, this cobweb, are uh, the restraints in this. This is actually a, a tutorial that's it, it, available just at the top left of the uh, Chimera X window there. It's a, the, the case here is a, the starting model is the ATP bound state of a membrane uh, uh, complex. And the target is the ATP free state, which is in a, a really quite different conformation. And to make visualization easy, you can drop down to a C alpha trace only. Um, and then using Isolde's relatively new option you to tug on a selection, we can just tug with the mouse. And that's performing all atom molecular dynamics as we tug, um, essentially in real time to, to get that fitted. And, and once we get reasonably close, we'll see that just drop into place. Um, And if you're really watching closely, you'll see on the other side here, we'll zoom in on it in a second, the bit that I'm, I'm not tugging on is, is refitting itself as, as this thing gets out of the way. And that on the left there is actually the ATP binding cleft, which no longer has ATP in it, but was still blocked in that confirmation until this, this domain moved. Now, if we pause and zoom in on that, you'll see what's actually going on there. Um, so just, okay, sorry, I was just looking at at the, the, the fit in this case. I, I will say in this particular case, the starting model is far from perfect. So there, there's still a lot of um, finer scale details to fix. But you see these, these restraints in purple here are the ones that have been stretched to the point where they've essentially given up. And if we put all the atoms back, we see the whole forest of these things. And you'll see the thickness of the restraint visualization is also proportional to the force that it's applying. Uh, they can also be adjusted. Um, you, can, you can choose to hide the ones that aren't actually strained at any point, and you can selectively release any, any given set of restraints via simple commands. So that's the adaptive distance restraints. Torsion restraints was something I've really wanted to add for a while. Uh, adaptive torsion restraints in, in a similar scheme, something I've really wanted to add for a while, but I was unsure of a, a nice periodic functional equivalent to um, the Gemma and McClure. And so I started looking around November-ish and thought, okay, the, the von Mises distribution, which is a, effectively a periodic normal distribution, has kind of the right functional form. And you, you can um, get this, this wider, narrower form to it, except it's the, the normalization term is not right. So as, as you widen it out, it also flattens, which isn't what we want. What we really want, I think, is a function where the maximum force applied by these things is independent of the width of the restraint scheme. And so the solution I, I came up with, with with that was just to take the uh, numerator of that equation up there and throw out the denominator, take the derivatives of that and find the maximum of the first derivative and normalize such that the max, so that that maximum first derivative is one and then integrate back to get the energy to function. So it looks like that. Um, uh, but, uh, for people that can speak math. Um, but uh, looks like that. So the, that kappa term sets the width of this thing. Um, the really nice thing that kind of just fell out of this is that as the kappa goes to zero, this thing just falls back to a perfectly normal cosine function, which is your standard um, restraint scheme for torsions in any case. So really nice. Um, so very new. Um, commands look just like the existing uh, restraint distances. And again, just put usage in front of that to actually see how they work. They're, and they look like the existing normal um, 
uh, restraints that I use for um, adjusting rotomers and flipping peptide bonds, except they have a different color scheme. And you can see here, just playing around with these on this lysine, if, if you stay close, they, they just restrain, but if we pull too hard on it, that one down at the bottom that's turned purple has effectively given up tugging. But then if I use Isolde's control panel to actually dial up a, a rotomer, you'll see in a second that uh, the, these are mutually in, um, exclusive. So if, if I dial up normal restraints uh, to, to apply a rotomer, then those are automatically turned off and vice versa. So now that is very, very new, but I have done a little bit of testing just to show where they might be useful, taking some random structures off the PDB. First example, 2OFO is a 3.16 angstrom resolution model from 2006-ish um, and restrained to 4PPF, a high resolution model with 90% um, sequence identity. And in each of these cases, spent about a grand total of about a minute, uh, essentially just selected the whole model, press play in Isolde, started 100 Kelvin, let it jiggle for a little while and then dialed the temperature down to zero, saved the coordinates and ran more probably. Um, without restraints, we see just by virtue of Isolde using a, a physical um, molecular dynamics force field, a lot of things fix themselves already. We've gone from 7% Ramachandran outliers to 2%. 2%. Um, Favoured has gone up by about 11%, uh, et cetera. Clash score, well, uh, the, the beauty, beauty of molecular dynamics in general is that clash score goes close to zero by default. But including the restraints makes a substantial difference. And again, I, I repeat, this was about one, one minute total. So of course, there's, there's still more work to do. There's, there, there's still human eyes needed to actually go through and, and do, do more cleaning up. And one more example, a little bit more challenging, um, a somewhat more problematic uh, starting model uh, with um, mole probability score of 4.1, which is uh, really up there. Um, and with a template that is uh, only 50% uh, sequence identity rather than 90%. Um, and um, not entirely perfect in itself. If I was to be doing this in earnest, I would probably actually spend a, a few hours just going through the template before I actually used it as a, as a um, model for, my, um, for my, my new model, as a reference for my new model. But you see again, it's the, the, the use of these restraints is actually improving things further. Anyway, um, I will leave it at that for now, just with some acknowledgements. The Chimerax team, of course, have been wonderfully helpful, particularly Tom Goddard. Um, the Clipper Python team for getting me started with the ins and outs of the use of Clipper for the crystallographic calculations. Um, OpenMM is the MD library that I'm using. All the peptide, valid, peptide and rotomer validation from the Richardson lab. Um, working on actually putting in a pipeline for ligand validations, uh, parameterizations from uh, Nigel Moriarty and Dave Case, and of course all the folks in the Reed Lab. And I'll take questions. Thank you, Tristan. Do we have any questions? Start with that one here. Very obvious, but um, before you start with a model, presumably you run sculpture to prune it first. Yeah, so that's quite good for crystal. Yeah, crystal, I, crystal I, it's, I feel like s slightly a liar right now by being in the model building um, category because it's older right now doesn't actually build. It requires a model to already be present. I. Most of the API is in place to actually start adding the, the ability to add residues to your model. But right now it's about rebuilding what's already there. So. Uh, if there's a 50% difference in sequence, you must have to do something. The way I, do, well, I, I do, do a sequence alignment. It's, it's, it's just, it's, uh, it's only so I, I, yes, I do a pairwise sequence alignment. Um, the, the paired residues are used and side chains are only restrained where the residues are, are actually identical. 
um, there, there is more work to be done to, I, I think, to actually really capitalize on, the, on these adaptive restraints that to, to actually bring in confidence scores to, to assign these, but that's a work in progress. Okay, uh, one question up at the back left there. Can you model the electrostatic potential of metal atoms and um, how would you take the oxidation state into consideration for these potentials? So I missed the second part, I'm afraid. Metal ions are absolutely uh, uh, supported out of the box, almost all of them. Um, I missed the second half of the question. Sorry. So the oxidation state will probably affect the electrostatic potential. So how, how would you determine the oxidation um, state? Well, actually, so one of the, the pitfalls of molecular dynamics at present is that at least in the, the implicit solvent environment you, you really need to use for this sort of tool where you don't have most of your water present, those really strong charges actually turn out to be incredibly counterproductive and it, 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 I've somewhat artificially but it works quite nicely, all metal ions are currently just plus one. <laughs> it, um, it, that's a long-term pro problem of molecular dynamics in general and the only real solution right now is to just parameterize all the different clusters and actually start introducing bonded angle restraints for those as well but that's that's not something there at the moment and for resolutions 3.3 and better the, the density is is usually enough to keep those under control quite happily okay and the final question up there at the back i guess it's related conserve structural waters if you've got them in a high resolution structure what happens to them when you go to your low resolution structure um well it's your choice uh really um so you can keep them in where they make sense to do so um and I've actually experimented with adding adding waters to well, the, the, this, the three, three angstrom uh, crystal model that's built in as my demo. And it's actually, it was actually really interesting and rewarding, I found. Um, the, 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 the environment, the MD environment will only allow you to add one, essentially one self-consistent water network. You can't add clashing waters or um, alternate complements at the moment. Um, but it's, I ended up getting that, that um, structure down to an R3 of 16%, I think, which is um, for a three angstrom structure is, is really, really down there by adding a, around 110 waters thereabouts. So it's possible. I haven't experimented a lot with waters yet, though. Just playing at the moment. I think we'd better move on. But that's thanks, Tristan, again for an excellent talk.